Hello, and welcome to part two of Plot the Dots. Today's topic is control charts, uh, also known as process behavior charts. Um, the term control is so misunderstood, and it actually is, isn't a very good term, so that's why uh, I call, we can call them process behavior charts. Control is in the concept of statistical control, which, as you will see, just means your process is stable. So it assesses the stability of your process, which will make a lot more sense when I'm through with this presentation. Okay. So last lesson was about run charts. And I kind of call that filter number one for a time sequence of data. All it answers is, did this process have any significant shifts during this time? That's it. But control chart now, and, and once we kind of see, do we have boiling water, ice water, take the average or correct averages, control chart now becomes filter number two. It answers the question, well, how much variation in my process is natural? And are any individual observations possible outliers? So those are two very important questions as well. And as I hope I will show you, the math required to convert a run chart to a control chart is elegantly simple. And as a result, uh, you will have a chart where it will motivate conversations you've never had before, and I'm hoping more productive conversations. So I'm hoping that as a result of this session, You'll be able to see how easy it is to calculate how much difference between two consecutive points is too much. You know, as you look at the performance this month versus last month or the performance this week versus last week. Well, of course, they're not the same number. But how much of a difference is too much? Or where does the threshold uh, between common cause and special cause? And then the other thing you can calculate is the expected range of your process's output so you don't overreact to common cause. In other words, what you will calculate is what your process is perfectly designed to get, even if you don't like it. So then the other, my other objectives are, can we quickly facilitate agreement on a strategy to improve a process, even if the variation to you seems out of control. Part of my job with this video is to get you very comfortable with the amount of variation and hopefully show you that it really doesn't matter in terms of improving the process. Let's stop the tendency to jump right to a process redesign or, or known solution in reaction to common cause. Um, there are some trainers, many of them as a matter of fact, who Will, who are teaching you the wrong thing in that they say if a process is common cause, you have to accept it, and the only way to do something about it is a process redesign. That is not true at all, and um, one of the um, upcoming lessons will sh show you common cause strategies. I'm going to demonstrate to you today an introduction to one of the more important ones, which is how do you take a vague situation that is in control and zero in on the important part of it. And that gets to my last objective, see the need to use stratification to focus a vital opportunity within a vague problem. Okay, quick review. Uh, last lesson was about a run chart, which is going to start off as our bread and butter tool. Always start by plotting your data in a run chart. And it's a time-ordered plot with the median drawn in as the reference. And I taught you two special cause tests. One is the trend test, which is six successive increases or six successive decreases. And that will be rare. And I think in, in the example I showed you, uh, it, all it indicates is a process in transition. 
Um, and another way that this test becomes very helpful is if you're in a meeting with tables of numbers and everybody's shooting from the hip. Um, that if that's all you're going to do, then you have to use six. And you will see, once we have the common cause or do the control chart, we don't have to be as conservative. And then the other rule is testing for a shift where you have eight data points in a row, either all above the median or all below the median. This is indicative of a shift during the time in which you studied the process. And I just want to reinforce what I said last lesson was that I would prefer when you do improvement work to collect more frequent samples over time. Okay, do you remember this? Where this is real data on bacteremias in a hospital, and if you're all people are doing is shooting from the hip, the tendency is to say, well, look, look right here. We trended down, and things got better, and then we went back up, and all of a sudden, everybody has to drop everything and find out why we went up. Which, as I showed you, with the run chart, over these 19 quarters, nothing had changed, despite the fact that they did 150 root cause analyses. Every month they had a quarterly meeting, uh, every three months, every quarter they had a meeting where they pulled the charts of the bacteremias and said, what should we have done differently, which is a special cause strategy. And this plot shows it to be common cause, and it also shows that all that work didn't really yield any change. And then I showed you that This process is perfectly designed in any one quarter, even though we're averaging eight. You're not going to get exactly eight every quarter, but that you will get a number between zero and 20. And that one quarter can differ from its previous quarter by as many as, yes, 15. And you're all saying, well, that, that's out of control. We, we don't like that. Well, I don't like it either, but I'm going to get you used to the fact that despite how much variation you seem, or how out of control it seems. It could very well be in control, and we can deal with it. OK. The math is very simple, as I hope you'll agree. So here are the 19 data points in their time order, and that's important, time order. And I determine what are called the moving ranges, which simply means I take each data point and subtract its predecessor. And it's the absolute value. In other words, it's variation. I don't care whether it's positive or negative. It also turns out this number has very nice statistical properties. The one time where, uh, how do I put it, easiness to calculate and statistics go hand in hand, that it is useful. OK, so the difference between 7 and 10 is 3. The difference between 3 and 7 is 4. And the next one would be the difference between 10 and 10, which would be 0. Yes, a moving range can be 0. And we go all the way down the numbers like this till we get to the 18th, where the difference between 5 and 12 is 7. So 19 data points produce 18 moving ranges because the first data point doesn't have a predecessor. So then we sort those 18 numbers to find the median. Yes, the median. So in this case, with 18 data points, it's going to be the average of the 9th and 10th. There's the data in its time order. There are the moving ranges. And here they are sorted from smallest to largest. And since there are 18, if you start counting from either end, they kind of meet in the middle here. I have to average the ninth and tenth, both, both of which happen to be four. So the median moving range is four. So now. That is the key. The median moving range is the number 
from which all the estimates of variation come. That is a very important number. And it doesn't matter whether you have 10 data points, 20, 30, 50, 100, 500, 1,000. If you do what I just did, and that is take the successive differences, absolute value of the successive differences, and take the median, all the information about the variation is contained in that median moving range. So taking that number, as you see, I have it here, this 3.865 is a constant from theory. It will never change, and you use it with the median moving range. Now I can hear some of you saying, well, Davis, can I take the average of the moving ranges? Yes, you can. Some of you may have even been taught that. And that's just as valid, except you have to use different constants. Now, here's why I teach the median moving range. As you will see, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. And the reason I teach it is you won't always have your computer. This is easy to do by hand in a boring meeting. Outside of that meeting with your computer, there's plenty of good software that will do this. So the reason I teach the median is to appeal to your intuition and that you can do it by hand in a boring meeting. So this constant is from theory to be used with the median moving range. And if I multiply the median moving range times 3.865, you get approximately 15, which once again, that is how much two consecutive, and let me emphasize, consecutive months can differ just due to common cause. So in other words, I'm looking for a big difference here. Here it looks like it went from 3 to 10. Now, some people might get upset about that. Well, it's less than 15. I really can't call it a special cause. And then the other thing we calculate is, because the run chart showed no special causes, I can calculate the average, and it's about 8. Now, I need to say, well, what is the, what I like to call a dead band of common cause around that average. And the way we get that is, once again, the median moving range times, in this case, 3.14, which is a number from statistical theory, once again, and it has nothing to do with pi, but if you multiply that times a median moving range, that gives you the dead band of common cause on either side of the average. So in this case, it would be approximately, approximately, 8 plus or minus 12. Now, here's something that's very important if you're going to present charts like this to doctors. You will see that 8 minus 12 is a negative number. Don't ever put a chart with a negative number in front of docs if, if the negative number doesn't make sense. I mean, you can't have a negative number of bacteremias. Set it equal to zero, or they will hoot you out of the room. So in this case, then, in any one quarter, averaging eight, given this pattern of variation, we will observe between zero to 20 bacteremias. Hard to believe? You might not like it. But that's what you are perfectly designed to get with this process. But here's the good news. Despite that wide variation, I'm going to introduce you to the first common cause strategy, which is called uh, stratification. What this means is the same process produced it. In essence, every infection was produced by the same process. So what that means is, here's the good news. So the bad news is you're perfectly designed to get this horrible result. But the good news is it's stable. So what does that mean? I can put all 150 together. And now here's a case where I say, I'm the statistician, I know nothing. You're the healthcare people, you know too much. That makes us a good team. I've done my job. I've kept you out of the data swamp. What I want you to put your brains to work on is, what are some ways we could slice and dice these 150 bacteremias? Joseph Duran, one of the quality giants of the 20th century, firmly believed in, in what he named the Pareto Principle, in that the cause of a problem is never vague, that usually in a situation, 
you can find the 20% of the process causing 80% of the problem. So in other words, if you were to slice and dice these, you could find the 20% of the reasons that account for 80% of these, and that allows you to focus. Because obviously, focusing on each one individually didn't work. And it's so easy, once you learn the quality tools, we can say, well, this is common cause. Oh my goodness, uh, we've got to do something, we've got to redesign. And you can go into a whole uh, process of saying what causes blood infections and use that cause and effect or Ishikawa diagram to categorize all the, all the causes. And you've probably all done it. I've done it, where we go into a situation say we need to redesign, and we come up with what I call the Ishikawa diagram from hell that takes up a whole wall. Whereas what we can do with stratification is what if we find out the problem is here and then start brainstorming? Because sometimes what happens too is we brainstorm all these reasons and we collect data on all these reasons and then quickly find that the problem is here. Now what has happened? You've made all these people mad, and you've lost some credibility for the next time you ask them to collect data. They have the memory of, hey, I did that once, they never used it. So this quote by Brian Joyner is very telling. You've got a big, vague problem, you're gonna have big, vague solutions that aren't gonna work very well. You've gotta focus, 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 so you get the effective solution. So yes, we try to use stratification to say what is the 20% of the process causing 80% of the problem. And as I said, the stability is the bad news, but it's also the good news because we can aggregate any stable period. And I think rather than look at the quarterly four infections, five infections, three infections, two infections, if you look at 150, you're gonna get the bigger picture. So once again, I want to stop the misconception that if it's common cause, I need to redesign the process. There's going to be a lot more about this in the lesson on common cause strategies. So all common cause means is I can't look at infections individually, and I can't treat the data points individually. That's all it means. But I can group things. So here's an example, and this is real data. And it might be a meeting you typically go to or, or have even experienced where you're looking at a year-over-year -year comparison of, say, falls. And I know falls are very important to you folks. So let's say uh, the, the, this year through November we have 64, but the same period last year we had 51. So you might say we're up 25%. Now, 25% to you seems like a big number. And we're going to treat it like a special cause because it's too big. We don't like it. We've got to do something about it. But we don't know if it's common cause or special cause yet. And not only that, they finally got a zero. Wonderful. But then what happened after the zero? They went up to nine. Horrible. What's wrong? And so now fear starts creeping in. Is the reporting going to be, reporting process going to be jeopardized? So let's plot the dots. Now I notice what people do a lot too is, so you'll have this year over year plot, and they always plot the last 12 months uh, with the excuse being, we need to see the trend. Well, you know how I feel about the word trend. But, okay, here are the last 12 months. There's a trend line put in, and you know how I feel about trend lines. And the CEO talks about how during these first four months, see, we were above average. So now he insisted on root cause analyses for every fall. Well, look what happened. It dropped, and that's good work. But look what happened after that. Look what happened. 
Do you see that trend? It isn't a trend. But a lot of people would call that a trend, get worried, and say, we need to start the root cause analyses again. And then you look and you say, good, it worked. But it's still at an unacceptable level. But at least we're now below average, whatever that means. So he gave you the funds to have a safety fair. So you could have keychains made up to say that say, fall in love with quality, give everybody a keychain, give them uh, education, show little videos, and oh my goodness, look what happened. It went to zero. Good work. In fact, buy everybody pizza. But then, good gracious, look what happened. You know what happens when you reward people, you know? So, does this seem like deja vu for a lot of you? I bet it does. Now, here's the beauty when you're at next time you're at a meeting like this. First of all, we don't do this. We don't panic because we saw this and said, all right, time for the cause and effect diagram. Remember, vague solutions to vague problems get you vague results. Let's understand the process. So do you realize by having this data, the year over year for 11 months, coupled with the last 12 months, you can reconstruct the last 23 months of performance. So there it is, the 23 months of performance. I sort it to find the median, so 23 numbers, which means it's going to be the 12th in the sorted sequence, 11 smaller. 11 bigger, but let's plot the dots. So over these 23 months, do you see, using our rules, do you see six successive increases, six successive decreases? Do you see any clumps of eight above the median, below the median? If you had improved over this time, you might see six successive decreases, or you might see a clump of eight above the median early in the data and or a clump of eight below the median later in the data. You see none of that. And all those root cause analyses, what has the net effect been? No change. So for the last 23 months, your process has been behaving like it is perfectly designed to behave. So now, since I don't have boiling water and ice water, I can calculate the average of 5.4. Now we want to know, in any one month, what can I expect? And we all panicked as it went from 0 to 9. Is that a special cause? So there are the 23 numbers in their time order. There are the moving ranges, which I now sort. So 23 numbers, 22 moving ranges, which means I have to average the 11th and 12th, both of which happen to be 3. So first of all, since the median moving range is 3, I multiply it by the 3.865, and it's approximately 11. So in other words, two months can differ, consecutive months can differ by as many as 11 falls. This jump from 0 to 9 is common cause. There was no need to overreact, even though you felt it was big. Some people might feel 10 is big, but this says, no, you have to wait till it's greater than 11. Okay. So now let's see what we're designed to get in any one month. So once again, the median moving range is 3. So to get the common cause, there's our average. And I take the median moving range times the 3.14. And if I do that, it turns out to be a range, and I we can have negative falls, 0 to 15. Believe it or not. There have been no 
special causes over this two-week period. But as you remember from that graph, there's been a lot of effort going on. So I hope what you've learned from this lesson is if you have a vague problem but can get a plot of data over time and a data sanity, aha, you'll be on your way to solving the right problem. And once again, I teach you to use the median moving range because that's easy to do by hand in a boring meeting. There are plenty of good software packages. And the one thing I want to emphasize is do not, do not use the standard deviation of all the data. You will never use the standard deviation calculation as you were taught in your basic statistics course again, ever. You have to get it by the moving ranges. So, to sum up, after you do the run chart, a control chart analysis helps you to understand the natural inherent variation that's present in your situation that you may or may not like. But regardless, see, regardless, it enables you to act appropriately in response to avoid the human tendency to treat all variation as special cause. Even when it seems out of control, it may not be. But the good news is we can deal with it if it's common cause. And that the best thing to do if you can is to somehow aggregate the data and come up with ways to slice and dice it to see if you can find the 20% of the process causing 80% of the problem. Like I say, I'm the statistician. I know nothing. You're the healthcare people, you know too much. That makes us a good team. You're smart people, and that's the problem. Because if in that falls example, I said, well, why, why did we go from um, um, 3 to 10? You're smart people. You'd go. You'd find a reason, except each one of you would find a different reason. Whereas I say, listen, we've got uh, X number of falls here. I think it was 191 falls. What are some ways we can slice and dice those to get some insight as to where the biggest problem in your process is, you're going to come up with wonderful theories that I couldn't even think of. That's where I want your brains to go. I want to focus your wonderful brain power. So thank you. Here's how to contact me. You can tell I like what I do a little bit. I welcome contact. 